Well, hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott, and we're recording this on the 4th of July on Independence Day, and we're all filled with the spirit. Uh, did a little talking on our backstage show for members only about the events of 1776. And, uh, gentlemen, several years before that, in 1729, the famous uh, British satirist Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels, uh, wrote a, a piece of satire. The topic at the time was that uh, the poor were having so many children, and they were not be able to to support them and furthermore these children will become a burden on the state and and so Swift in probably the greatest example of irony and satire ever said the problem is simple just poor people just take your children sell them to rich people they can eat them so I have two modest proposals for you today gentlemen for the health of the Republic one of them is somewhat serious the other one's completely whimsical um, Steve I'll give you the whimsical one. Oh, I like a little whimsy uh, we have in our little neighborhood uh, an event that uh, on the 4th of July that is, is not nearly big enough to be called a parade, and that's why I like it so much. Everybody in our neighborhood, it's a very well-defined little neighborhood, gathers uh, on this corner, and then we just walk through the neighborhood waving flags. There's no floats, there's nothing. There's a, there's a fire engine, but that's about it. And just prior to this, um, uh, a gentleman came up to the door to deliver uh, some, some groceries, and... Uh, Indian gentleman and he said oh your house is so beautiful I love the flag and everything and it's such a beautiful day and stuff I said well thank you that's very kind he said this is such a great country I said are you a citizen he says I'm working to being one I said well you are welcome here sir my wife is an American citizen now I think this is her first fourth of July as an American citizen so here's my modest proposal to you Steve the the, the whimsical one my experience with people who 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 legally come to this country who wait for years in line and then once they get here have to go through all these bells and whistles. It's a, for, for Natasha, it was a five-year process pretty nearly and, and not an inexpensive one either. When I saw this man here and his deep love and appreciation for America, I realized, you know, the, the fastest way we could turn this country into a genuine paradise would be to accept anybody who wanted to come here legally come to america become an american work hard contribute to the to the melting pot become an american put all those previous identities aside but here's my modest proposal in exchange for every one person that we let into the country like that as a legal immigrant i think we should at state expense pay for people who don't want to be here to go and live in another country <laughs> Conditional, conditional for one year, and after one year, that's it. You're you're there. I think we ought to pay for it, because because the people that hate this country, in this country, are the people who are from this country. I've never met a foreigner in America ever hate America. I've never met a naturalized American hate America. The only people I know that hate America are people who've been raised here with all of these freedoms. And frankly, I got to tell you, I see this as a win-win, Steve. If we were to take all the people that wanted to be here and swap them out for all the people that don't want to be here, I think most of the people that don't want to be here would want to come back after a year. I really do. Yeah. I think that, the, that they've been taught that this is the worst place in the world. And so I say, why don't we let them go live in some of these other uh, paradises and see how they feel about America one fourth of July later. What do oh, you think? Oh, so many things. I'm reminded of a, a, a story Ayn Rand told in one of her nonfiction essays about uh, she was giving a, a speech somewhere and somebody interrupted her, giving a you know whatever. This is why I love America speeches. And somebody asked her, well, you know, how, you know, you're, you weren't even born here. What do you know about being an American? And she said, well, you know, I, I fled Soviet Russia and then I worked my ass off to become an American citizen. What did you do other than be born here? Hmm. Yeah, uh, we yeah. we tend to take these things for granted. That said, um, uh, I'm I'm thinking of a, a sliding scale. If uh, if you're just a kind of a standard lefty who doesn't like guns, we ship you off to Canada, which is uh, you know, a <laughs> lot like America. It's got a nice economy and that kind of thing, but uh, uh, no guns. So okay, you can go to Canada. If you are, say, a professor of political science with Marxist leanings, uh-uh, right off to Venezuela with you, buddy. And uh, that that whole uh, six months, year, whatever it is, uh-uh, no. You're not coming back. Ever. Um, there, there are a few problems we're going to have to work out. I have the feeling that... You're always there harsh in my mellow, yeah, man. Go as, ahead. Uh, as... As far left as 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 
basically authoritarian as Canada has gone under uh, under Trudeau these last eight or ten years. Um, if we ship them enough Democrats, uh, they're going to close the border. Uh, Canada is going to become heavily militarized, and I'm pretty sure we're going to go to war. And we can't take off Canada, or where are we going to send our Democrats? See, the Canadians will be buying HIMARS to protect themselves from the Russian so, Democrats. Floating exactly. Up. So we've, we've, we've got some issues here that uh, we're, we're going to have to, to work out some kinks. Um, but overall, um, I'm, I'm very much in, in favor of this plan. And uh, I think we need to start with the Marxist professors. Let me, let me just elaborate on one thing here on yeah. this for you, Steve, because... I had this. I had this feeling extraordinarily strongly. Um, we had a, a very kind donor uh, from Norway who um, who was actually in the last year, uh, last months of his life. And I went to Norway to thank him for his kind donation. I got a chance to spend four days with him in Norway. Norway is an astonishingly well-run country. Oslo is spotless. I spent a couple of hours in the um, airport at Stockholm, and when I was sitting in the airport at Stockholm. The thing that struck me the most was how quiet it was, how absolutely politely quiet it was. There's no yelling, no screaming. People were sitting there quietly reading books. And when I talk about swapping people out for a year, I'm not talking about sending them to Mogadishu. If you sent young American kids, the ones who hate this country so much, to some place which they consider to be paradise like Sweden, and they had to behave themselves if they had to sit quietly, couldn't play their music, couldn't walk up into, you know what I mean? If they had to, if, if, if purple hair was frowned upon and, and, and any display of individuality was, was frowned upon, I'm not sending, saying send them to Mogadishu. I'm saying if you sent them to Sweden, they would want to come And again, this, this, this is all a part of my sliding, my sliding scale here. You know, the Canada here for, this, for these kinds of people, uh, Sweden for the, 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 the loud kids, or maybe even Germany. You know, uh, I took some German in high school and, and in college. You can learn a lot about uh, people by the, the language they speak. Um, in, in America, when we want to say uh, everything's fine, we say, oh, it's okay. And okay is one of those things we don't even know where the word comes from. It was originally an acronym, and uh, it's, it's got a... a, a murky history where we, we don't even know but it doesn't matter because it's and okay. that's okay exactly <laughs> yeah uh, okay. in germany if you want to say everything is okay oh uh-uh, no 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 all is in order yeah okay <laughs> okay <laughs> all is in order yeah okay whatever scott this one this one is less whimsical i'm serious about this one or at least i'm possibly serious about it um <sighs> There are problems with this idea, but uh, there are a lot of merits with it, too. We all grew up at a time when civics was taught in high school, where where uh, civics were taught in things like Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts or whatever the case may be. But the point is, is that when we were schooled, before we were of voting age, which used to be 21, we had a pretty good understanding of how the country works. And when we were handed the reins of the country, which is the idea of a, of a, a democratic republic, we at least knew how the machine that we were expected to drive operates. That's not true anymore. When my wife took the citizenship, uh, the naturalization citizenship test, there were a hundred questions. Ten of them are chosen randomly. I just lost Scott. I lost somebody. The internet hiccup. Sorry. A uh, hundred potential questions. Ten of them chosen randomly. You had to pass six. Now, my wife didn't take the test until she was consistently getting 100% on everything. But I'm serious about this now. Do you think it's unreasonable? You're, if you're born here, you have the rights of a citizen and protections and all the, all the rest of it. But do you think it's an unreasonable burden to say that if you're going to vote in this country on how to run, on how to run this country, you should, pass, you should have to pass the same test of basic understanding of this country that people who come to this country and become American citizens have to pass. You know, at, at the very least, with the level of uh, federal funding and demands on local school districts uh, that the local school dis- districts comply with because they want the federal funding, um, you would think that that would be a standard part of the curriculum. Like, you can't graduate from an American high school unless you can demonstrate an understanding of the fundamentals of American uh, government 
and how this country works. Now, of course, you're going to get into all kinds of how do we interpret how this country works. I don't mean commentary on the Constitution. I mean the actual words of the Constitution. I mean an actual uh, being able to describe the framework and the checks and balances and things like that. Um, you can have whatever opinion on that you want to have, but you should at least be able to understand how the machine works. Uh, it would be like saying, well, yeah, we're going to give Scott a, a driver's license. And then I get in the car with my driver's license and I go, now, what does this uh, pedal down here do? Um, you know, <laughs> yes. it's like... I, I should at least know what that pedal down there does uh, before I'm allowed to get behind the, what is this in front of me? Oh, it's kind of round. It's a wheel. Do I You'll figure it out. Just, do just, I move this stick here? What does it do? <laughs> and, you know, it, it seems silly when you say it that way. And, uh, and I know, you know, it, civics kind of fell out of popularity and got replaced by what we called social studies into which they wove a bunch of things, including uh, history and government and social psychology and things like that. Uh, but I think everybody would be happier, at least if they understood how it worked. And you might still have the same divisions uh, across the country. You might still have people who hate this country, but at least they would be hating it knowledgeably. Um, I think one of the, uh, the amazing things about these United States of America is that we have the luxury of hating it. I mean, we are, we are bathing in this warm, soft place where it's okay to hate the United States of America and you can still go down to Trader Joe's and get yourself a $7 avocado. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the amazing thing about uh, this land, that you have the luxury of disagreeing. Um, I, I've told this story before, but I remember being at a at a rest stop on a interstate highway, and there was a guy who was wearing a T-shirt. At the time, uh, President George Bush, uh, George W. Bush was in office, and he had this T-shirt that had a, a portrayed a President Bush as a vampire sucking the blood from the neck of Lady Liberty, the, the Statue, the Statue of, Liberty, of Liberty. Yeah. Yes. And I told my wife when I got back in the car, I said, I wanted to go over to that guy and go, Ooh, you better, you better hide that shirt. I mean, they're everywhere. They're going to see that. And man, will you be in trouble? <laughs> No, he wouldn't. He could he could stand in line with a White House tour group wearing that shirt and walk right into the White House where George W. Bush was living at the time and still be able to do that because it's here. Uh, it's it's there. You're in the United States. You don't get that freedom everywhere you go. And to the extent that you do get freedoms, they are modeled after the freedoms that we enjoy in these United States. There's a great editorial in the Wall Street Journal, I believe, um, that is from, I think, July 4th, from Volodymyr Zelensky paying tribute and saying basically happy birthday to the United States of America, but talking about how uh, we don't need less American exceptionalism, we need more of it. Um, speaking of that T-shirt, uh before my wife passed her citizenship test, well, she got 10 out of 10 on it. She would have got 100 out of 100 on it. Uh, she was very, very serious about it. Didn't go until she ready, and she probably had a pretty decent teacher, too. Uh, we were at a 7-Eleven, and uh, President Trump was in office, and there were for sale pencil sharpeners featuring uh, the likeness of Donald Trump's uh, form. And I'll leave it to you to figure out where the pencil went. Yeah. But my wife was uh, was said they just should not allow this. It just should be it's disgrace it's dis disgraceful and it's disrespectful. Shouldn't be allowed. And I sat down and said, you know, well, honey, who who decides? You know, who gets to decide? Where is the line? I remember that day very clearly because it's one of two times in the last seven years when I've won an argument with my wife. <laughs> uh, but, but, and the other one was a mistake. The other, yeah, I'm skeptical. Yeah, the other one was. <laughs> She wasn't there for the other one. <laughs> <That's right>. uh, <laughs> but seriously, I when, I when I say something like you should have to pass the citizenship test, I don't say that lightly. I'm not saying I'm 100 percent in, in the in favor of the idea, but I am saying it should be talked about. And when I say I don't say that lightly, I do seriously have genuine concerns about anything that keeps people away from the uh, from the right to vote. A, a poll tax yeah. where you have to pay money to vote. You can make a strong case that if you have to pay to vote, then you don't 
then you don't, if you have to have a certain amount of property to vote, then you don't vote yourself money out of the treasury. But that argument is outweighed by the access of, of, of people's rights as citizens to vote in their republic. That's just that simple. So things like that concern me. And I know for a certain fact that if you tried to do that, that would be the argument that you're just trying to repress the vote. But speaking as a member of the privileged white aristocracy, patriarchy, uh, white supremacist movement, uh, I am genuinely worried about about having something like that keep people out of the polling booth. But then I say to myself, then I say to myself that having spent better part of a year preparing my wife for the citizenship test, I was astonished and impressed at how completely non-political those questions were, how absolutely ideology free they were. They were simple mechanical problems. Simple things, describe the three types of government, who creates legislation, who, what happens in the event of the incapacitation of the president, who is the president, who's the vice president, who's your representative, who's the governor of your state. And, and I don't see anything in that test that creates an obstacle or a hurdle for anybody, especially to get six out of ten. That, that, that causes any reasonable person to say, no, this is not something we could do. It would require a little work. But to be perfectly honest with you folks, I think requiring a little work in citizenship is something that this country could use an awful lot more of these days. Our problem is we have been so successful at defending our rights and our luxuries that we simply just take them for granted. But when you have, when you have genuine cases of, of modern school kids who cannot name three countries outside of the United States, and in fact, when you ask them, some of them will say the United States is a country. What's the capital of the United States? I don't know. Who was the first president of the United States? I don't know. Scott's saying, well, that's not all of them. I agree. I agree. And I understand that those interviews are cherry picked for effect. But the fact of the matter is, is there is a large and growing chasm of misunderstanding and 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 diseducation of people regarding this astonishing country, what it represents, and how it works. And I don't find it unreasonable to say that if you're going to be given control of the most powerful invention in the history of the world, you should at least have a fundamental understanding of how to get into the vehicle, how to turn it on, how to turn it off, and how to get back out again. That's all I'm asking. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I want to wish everybody out there a happy Independence Day. I definitely feel like things have really started to change for the better, that that people are really starting to get a little fed up about those things. But that's a story for another time. We'll get to that next week right here on Right Angle.